Hi, my name is Dori Klesis, and I'm with the Mount Sinai Health System in New York. Today, I'm with Dr. Harold Koplowitz, the founder, the president, and the medical director of the Child Mind Institute in New York. We're also joined by Dr. Carrie Quinn, who's a pediatrician and the executive director of the Mount Sinai Parenting Center. Thank you for joining us. It's our pleasure. Thank you. Dr. Koplowitz, what is the mission of the Child Mind Institute? So the Child Mind Institute is an independent nonprofit that is trying to transform the lives of children who struggle uh, with a mental health or a learning disorder. That's 17 million kids in the United States alone, one out of five, who have a very real, very common, and very treatable disorder. And we're doing that by offering gold standard care. We've seen kids from 48 states, the District of Columbia, and 44 nations. We also are trying to find a biomarker. We're trying to find the difference between one atypical child and another. But the way we're doing that is with big data and also open science, so something that is hard for someone my age to buy into, but I've bought in fully, is that you share your data before you publish. And by doing that, you get scientists from around the world to look at your data and participate in the project. So at the Child Mind Institute, we've produced 200 articles in the last eight years, but 2,000 articles have been written by other scientists from other institutions who are using our data to help us find that biomarker. And the third thing is participating in events like this. We think that public awareness is essential. Childmind Org. Our website has 29 million unique visitors and we get another million users every single month. So I think parents are desperate for information about what to do when their kids are struggling with emotional problems, behavioral symptoms, or learning symptoms. So you mentioned the word parents. So Dr. Quinn at the uh, Parenting Institute or Center at Mount Sinai, what are your goals with that uh, center? Um, well, at the Mount Sinai Parenting Center, um, our, our main goal is really to maximize um, the opportunities in regular routine pediatric um, health care to help parents and families build the skills they need to optimize their development and really to build strong um, parent-child relationships. Um, so we all are, are learning the importance of that early parenting environment and the interactions and the behaviors of parents that promote um, a child's optimal development. So their language development, their social emotional development, their cognitive development, and really as we're learning which parenting behaviors are um, key to developing those, we realize that the access to parents to deliver that information is so um, available in the healthcare system and we're not leveraging that opportunity um, the best we can. So really at the Parenting Center, we are, we are trying to find every healthcare moment, every touch point with families to help deliver that science and help them, help support those families in um, their child's development. There's 17 million children in the country with mental health disorders. Has that number been growing? Uh, tell us what you both feel about those children. I, I think the number, in fact, I know the number has been consistent, and that's a big problem because the overwhelming majority of these kids do not get help. And one of the reasons I think a parenting center that is not only training pediatricians, but making sure the whole healthcare system is using every touch point to give parents information is that parents are the first line of attack. And unfortunately, parents wait somewhere between two and seven years from the onset of symptoms before they reach out to a mental health professional. So the first thing we have to do is educate uh, America about how real, common, and treatable these disorders are. And once parents recognize that they're not alone, that there's very effective treatment, I think that changes um, how quickly or how slowly they get help. I think there's one number we should all be aware of, and that is suicide. 5,000 young people between the ages of 14 and 24 will commit suicide suicide this year. That number has been consistent for at least 20 years. 600,000 in the past four years have been going to the emergency room every year because of suicidal ideation or behavior. That number has just recently jumped to 1.2 million. That means one every 30 seconds, somewhere in the United States, a teenager is going to an emergency room because of that. And that, in my opinion, is just inexcusable. We, we should be able to get to those kids before they need to go to an emergency room, where a pediatrician, a parent, a teacher, a mental health professional can intervene more effectively than an emergency room where the situation is so desperate that they, they have to go to the same place where people are going after car crashes or heart attacks or gunshot wounds. Right. Uh, and, and to add to that, I think the, the importance of the awareness and the education to parents is so critical. 
And um, oftentimes, like Dr. Kopowitz said, that parents are the first ones to, to notice problems. But sometimes the, the pediatrician, if they're more aware and um, attuned to um, the earliest signs, sometimes they come out as medical symptoms before someone even realizes there's a problem. So it might be a problem with sleep. It could be a problem paying attention in school. It could be a problem with, you know, um, you know, trouble eating. Um, and, and there are all of these problems that might show up in the parents coming to the pediatrician with these concerns and we're not even realizing that behind these symptoms there's you know a larger problem brewing and when so, we th and when we think about the fact that pediatricians are the first line of defense and they they have to get a lot of training done in three years uh, during their residency but the number one disorder that affects children by by far are mental health disorders. I mean, there's 17 million of those kids. There's 7 million with asthma. There's 200,000 with diabetes. There's 15,000 with cancer. So we this kind of center, this kind of training for pediatricians is a model that, frankly, the whole nation should be using because um, pediatricians uh, need more of that kind of training to deal with that number one disorder. Right. I, it was probably the number one thing that um, my friends and I, when we finished our training, our pediatric residency training we thought we were going to be you know facing the medical problems that we've been trained for meningitis and pneumonia which antibiotic to use and it was a huge surprise to get into primary care and realize oh you know children on uh, from that standpoint are healthier than they've been before but the mental health component is what was coming up in the visits it was behavioral problems and developmental problems and anxiety right. and discipline issues and these things that we weren't trained for. So we felt a huge um, gap in our knowledge and training. And so one of the first initiatives of the Parenting Center has been a pediatric residency curriculum that really focuses on those um, issues, those behavioral and developmental concerns and how parents can best handle and manage them um, in a way that will optimize their child's development. And really should be something as a national model. I mean, the fact that Mount Sinai is instituting it is great, but hopefully it's something that other medical schools will follow across the country. Well, you, you perfectly um, mm -hmm. bring up the point that we are not doing it just at Mount Sinai because we thought that too. We at first started with saying, let's train the Sinai residents because they don't know. And then we quickly realized, you know what, we can scale this to every pediatric training program across the country. So there are 210 pediatric residency training programs which train over um, 2,500 new pediatric residents every year. So we built this curriculum in a way that could scale to all the programs. That's so we true. built it online, it's self-directed, and it's an engaging curriculum that residents can um, take. And we've piloted it this past year at eight programs all across the country. So we have Children's LA, Mass General, um, Tulane, Utah, University of Texas, um, Southwestern, and Mount Sinai, Mass General. We have Ten, uh, eight programs right now taking it. And this July, we're going to open it up. And we've been building a robust online platform to handle, hopefully, eventually getting to all 210 Terrific. programs. Right. So you're right, it's, it's, every program needs it. And it becomes essential, so. Yes, yeah, it's, it's really fundamental to our training as pediatrician. Dr. Koplowitz, you say there are biological uh, causes of childhood mental health disorders. What are they and how would you describe? So I, I think the way we have to think about mental health is very often the same way we have to think about physical health. There's a genetic component. In fact, the way we should think about it is that nature, the genes, um, the, our, our whole birth um, is what loads the gun and the environment pulls the trigger. So overwhelmingly, children are healthy, right? It's 20% it, of the population suffer from one of these disorders, but 80% are doing just fine. And so the goal should be, when we do know there's a genetic loading, we might have to be better parents than average. Now, the thing that I find fascinating is that anxiety, which is the most common disorder that we have, is only 35% genetic. However, there's something called assortative mating. It seems that anxious people find anxious people to marry each other and that people with ADHD seem to find people with ADHD to marry so that we double load it and so we now have a 70% chance of every time we make a baby the child might have a risk for an anxiety disorder that doesn't mean again 70% doesn't mean you always are going to have it so 
I think the message is loud and clear. Parents don't cause mental health disorders, but parents can make it significantly better or they can make it significantly worse. Ignoring it is a terrible thing. Anxiety that goes untreated puts a child at greater risk for depression during their teen years. Um, getting adequate treatment can change the whole trajectory of a child's life. Um, but most great parents know that their job is to accentuate their assets, get them piano lessons if they have a musical ear, and minimize their deficits, get them a math tutor if they're having trouble learning arithmetic or doing geometry or algebra. So biology is very important, but simultaneously parenting can make it significantly better. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the things we do are learning a lot of the research about exactly what you said, the, the genes plus the environment really program a child's um, health and well-being. So we have a, a researcher at Mount Sinai, Rosalind Wright, who is doing a lot of research on um, exactly, you know, which influences can help um, put a child at risk for more disease and illness, which environmental factors can put them at, at risk, and then which ones can actually minimize that risk. So certain environments and parenting styles that can help alleviate, you're right. It's not, it's not one or the other, it's a combination of those, the genes and the environment. I, so I certainly think that once we can find a biomarker, things will change dramatically. Now, it's not coming tomorrow, but it could, could come in our lifetimes. So in the same way that you can say strep throat you know you need penicillin, you know that you can get rid of the strep throat, it won't, therefore you won't have the secondary problems of it going to your heart. The same thing could happen if we could find a biomarker for mental health disorders. Dr. Quinn, do you think we can prevent against childhood mental disorders with good parenting? Um, well, it's a very complicated question and I, I think um, prevention is, you know, a, a very difficult thing for something that is both biological and, you know, factors in a child's early experiences. So I think there are lots of things that can help. Um, and we know there are a lot of studies that show there are skills that children can build in the early years that help them have tools ready when they come upon challenges. So whether it's, you know, you know, learning to manage emotions, learning, you know, early steps of labeling emotions and managing emotions, which parents can help them with, or, um, you know, abilities to manage their behaviors and impulse control. We know there are things that can be taught in the early years that help put them in a better place when they get older and they face more challenging um, experiences. So the one thing I would want to warn against is I don't want a parent to feel that they somehow caused their child to have a mental health disorder. That was something that went on decades ago. For instance, something, a disorder as debilitating as autism was literally blamed on mothers. Uh, they were called icebox moms. So a mom who didn't pick up their infant enough was the cause for autism. Nothing could be further from the truth. Now that we know what the brains of kids look like, we can see that there's differences in their speech and hearing. So the last thing I want is for a parent who has a sick child to say, oh, if only you had been better at regulating emotion. I think we can minimize we can, we can minimize um, the symptoms, we can improve outcomes when we get parents on board, but I don't think there are, there are certainly certain disorders we can't prevent. But parents can um, improve or help give them strong emotional health? Can they do things to improve their emotional health? So I think the number one thing you can help is communication. And we teach parents of kids who have difficulty communicating how they can help their kid communicate. So if you look at a kid who has selective mutism, who literally only talks to mom and dad and won't talk to strange, everyone else is considered a stranger, we can help parents actually be part of the team that helps that child develop better communication with everyone. That is pretty impressive and how quickly we can do it also because that you can flip the fact that a parent is so worried they start answering the questions for the child instead of encouraging them to have better communication. Right. Yeah, no, I agree. It's all about building skills in both the parents and the children and so. to help better uh, manage and deal with, you know, challenges that come. Okay, and Finally, um, Dr. Quinn, do you think we have enough specialists when you do see an issue in a, ch in a child? Do you know, is it easy to refer? It's probably the number one thing that pediatricians feel frustrated with is the um, lack of available specialists or the time that it takes to get someone in to see a specialist. Um, and we, we know there's major efforts to increase the training of specialists. We know we also need to increase the ability of pediatricians to be able to 
help in that interim of what can they do, right. what tools can they provide to the parents while they're <clears> waiting, <throat> or if there aren't um, specialists. I had a, a colleague re about a year ago tell me in the state of Mississippi, and I don't know if this is still the case, that she only had one developmental and behavioral pediatrician in the state that she could refer patients I, I, to. I'm sure that's true, because there's only 8,500 child psychiatrists in the whole country. So there are going to be, and there are, I think, only 2,000 developmental and behavioral pediatricians in the whole country, and there's 17 million kids. So we have to come up with a better plan. We have to train psychologists in evidence-based treatments like cognitive and behavioral therapy, parent management training. Social workers have to be part of the same army. But I certainly think we need to help pediatricians be that first line of defense, that if they had more in their toolbox, they might be able to either avoid necessarily a referral to a mental health professional or make sure that the child is being maintained while we wait to, to get that child there. The other big dilemma is uh, insurance coverage. There is truly, we still lack parity. The coverage for physical health is not equal to what we des what mental health deserves. It should be the same, and that hasn't happened yet. Yeah, no, it's frustrating. We're constantly, you know, we do find someone to refer to, and they're like, oh, they don't accept their insurance. So right. there is this huge gap in ability to send people to qualified right. specialists. Thank you very much for joining us today. A lot to do, but with you folks on the <laughs> spearheading it, we'll do great. Thank you well, very thank much. You. Yes, thank you.